Mesdames et Messieurs, j'aimerais vous souhaiter la, la bienvenue à cette table ronde sur les visions de la paix vues du côté de l'Organisation des Nations Unies, en remerciant d'abord nos trois, les trois participants à cette table ronde, M. Michael Müller, le directeur général de l'Organisation des Nations Unies à Genève, et deux historiens du département d'histoire internationale de, de l'Institut, David Rodonio, spécialiste de questions humanitaires, notamment de l'histoire humanitaire internationale, et euh, Jussi Animaki, spécialiste de la guerre froide. C'est un grand plaisir pour nous de vous accueillir ici pour cette dernière journée des rencontres de Genève, Histoire et Cité. Merci et à tout à l'heure. Good afternoon. Can you hear me? Okay. So when the conveners of the History Festival, under the presidency of Mr. Kofi Annan, reflected on the theme, Construire la Paix, they put forward no less than 12 possible subjects, such as uh, peace relation with art, reconciliation and oblivion, interior peace and threats to peace. But our event today, will focus more particularly on the meanings and conceptions of peace, on the protection and promotion of peace, and on one crucial actor of peace, the United Nations Organization. Allow me to open this session with a few remarks on the conceptions of peace. Historian Bruno Arcidiacono, one of the pillars of the Graduate Institute, and of its International History Department for more than 25 years, recently published a book entitled Cinq Types de Paix, in which he examines the history of perpetual peace plans from the 17th to the 20th century. This important book fostered our reflection on UN visions of peace and les plans de pacification perpétuelle. As we know, plans of perpetual pacification go beyond the absence of war and strive to realize the impossibility of war, which is an altogether different, far more ambitious objective than the mere absence of war. The UN Director General, Mr. Muller, is here to prove whether or not perpetual peace is the ideal objective of his and our organization. For we should not forget that we, the peoples, are the UN. The UN Director General will certainly expand on integrated and multifaceted dimensions and expressions of peace. Bruno Arcidiacono identified a precise taxonomy of peace visions and projects. He claims that for the last 300 years, the plans of perpetual, perpetual pacification have been of five kinds only, and that these five kinds of peace have been mutually exclusive. I think that the UN adopted at least one of them. In our conversation, we will reflect on what has changed since 1945, when the UN were created, and how things could change for the UN and for us in the foreseeable future. According to our colleague, the first kind of peace is hegemonic. It is a tempting plan only for monarchs and universal hegemons. And for obvious reasons, it cannot suit the United Nations. The second kind of peace is the balance of power, la paix d'équilibre which becomes an extremely difficult kind of peace if the number of actors involved with it increases. This is definitely a kind of situation that the UN must have considered in the past and will certainly 
have to consider in the future. Whether this is or not the UN vision of peace, we will find out in a minute. The third kind of peace is the political union, in which associated members acknowledge the superiority of a common authority. This could possibly correspond to one of UN visions of peace, but it looks like a revolutionary and quite utopian vision, at least for the time being, because it would entail a substantial renunciation to the prerogatives of state sovereignty. The fourth kind of peace is the international law peace, la paix du droit international, which in 1795, philosopher Immanuel Kant referred to as the Fedus Pacificum. <coughs> to some extent, the UN predecessor, the League of Nations, adopted this scheme. Its states member were supposed to renounce the war and replace it by trial. The mechanics of the system were guaranteed by collective security. As we all know, when the latter failed, the entire system collapsed. The president of the League of Nations heavily affected the way in which the UN fathers and the very few mothers envisioned peace in San Francisco in 1945. The fifth and last kind of peace, identified by my colleague Bruno Cidiacono, is la paix de directoire, which cannot be realized if the great powers, which are the members of the directoire, do not act in concert. The UN system was funded upon such directorial tradition as indicated by its structure and by the pivotal role of the UN Security Council. The main concern of the Charter is peace. First and foremost, peace among the great powers, among the members of the Directoire. And this is clearly spelled out in Article 24 of the Charter. The UN Charter and the kind of peace it heralds seem to be inadequate to the Cold War bipolar system that dominated international relations from the end of the Second World War up until 1989. It seemed equally at odds with the unipolar system that prevailed throughout the 1990s and in the early 2000s. What about the last 10, 15 years? What kind of peace does the UN envision in an international system that is not any longer bipolar or unipolar? Does the UN Charter and the directorial kind of peace it promotes better suit the current international system? We will deal with this and other issues in a second. Let me conclude taking on a clear position as to where I see evidence of the UN vision of peace as belonging to the perpetual kind of peace. I will limit myself to the reading of an excerpt of the UN Charter Preamble. We, the peoples of the United Nations, uh, determined to save succeeding generations from the scourge of war, determined to reaffirm faith in fundamental human rights and to establish conditions under which justice and respect for the obligation arising from treaties and other sources of international law can be maintained and to promote social progress and better standards of life in larger freedom and for these ends to practice tolerance and live together in peace with one another as good neighbors and uh, to unite our strength to maintain international peace and security. So, Mr. Director General, allow me to ask you the very first question of this session. What do you see as the main differences in the vision of peace of the United Nations in 1945 or during the Cold War and today? Thank you. Thank you. Oh, well, sorry. Um, well, <clears throat> first of all, thank you for inviting me to this. And um, I'm very pleased to be here. And I'm pleased to see that um, we are uh, sort of delving into the past in order to find solutions for the future. Um, this is obviously a place to do so. Geneva 
where you mentioned the League of Nations and um, our predecessor, in which um, a number of lessons were um, drawn on to create the United Nations that we have today. So um, I'm very pleased that um, you have set up this um, history event, and I hope that it will be repeated. I think it's, it bears doing, particularly when we are in a, in a sort of increasingly fractured world where we are looking for, for answers, and we sometimes forget that a lot of the answers we're looking for have actually already been uh, cooked up in the past in different situations, but are maybe useful uh, today. So um, I think it's very appropriate that your last quote, um, the, the Charter of, uh, of the United Nations, because um, the ones, our forefathers who wrote it were actually pretty smart people and very prescient people who wrote a document that is still very much um, relevant today. Um, it's a vision of peace that uh, links security, development and human rights and shows how they're mutually reinforcing and how we can't have one without the other. And it's a vision of peace that highlights that a healthy and sustainable society um, is, is uh, the need, need is more than, uh, than the absence of war. That we need justice, we need equity, we need respect for rights, we need inclusive communities and empowerment of individuals, which is why the Charter starts with we the peoples. And that's very much true today. It may be, in a, in a, certainly in our understanding of how the world works, even more true um, in many ways than it was uh, 70 years ago. So it's still the foundation of our work today, and I think it's still very much the foundation of the way we, the, the institutions, the family of institutions, look at the world. Um, the connections that uh, the Charter sets out um, in it, it, it are even more um, obvious today than they were then. Um, and when we look back, it's clear that, um, that 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 understanding that fueled the document and underpinned the document were um, forgotten during the Cold War, where um, in the midst of superpower rivalry, the division of peace was limited to a more narrow understanding of peace as the absence of armed conflict, and with the theory of mutually assured, assured destruction as uh, as the uh, the, the, the guarantor of this understanding of what peace uh, was. Um, I think that the, the, the legacy of that period of, of the Cold War is also one of the main reasons why we have not, until now, or we are now, we are now trying to, and we are coming out of that narrow understanding, that we haven't succeeded in fully implementing a more holistic vision of peace that the, that the Charter sets out. Um, and, and this limited interpretation of what peace means has continued to, to influence and continues till this day to influence to a large extent the policy discourse, um, both at the United Nations and in the international community more generally. And this is one of the things that uh, we are all working out to change and um, um, we'll come back to that in a little while. Um, we see it, for example, the, the sort of practical um, implementation or the practical voice of that we saw it even um, as far as go as far back as uh, or as, as recently, if you want, as 15 years ago, when um, we elaborated the Millennium Development Goals that set out the sort of world roadmap for how we would, we collectively would develop the world, in which um, there was no reference to security, and um, um, though we knew already then, and we certainly know now that armed conflict and violence are some of the greatest impediment to development and to progress. This is shifting, um, slowly, but it's shifting. In the new set of goals that are being developed right now, the Sustainable Development Goals, um, which hopefully we will um, have approved in one form or the other at the end of this year, there is, in the current draft, a reference to uh, peaceful societies, to the rule of law and to justice. It's one of the more contested parts of the, of the draft, um, some of our member states, as you will see when you read the newspapers, are still more comfortable with a more basic interpretation of what peace and security means. Um, we, we have seen over the past years an interesting shift uh, in, the, in the discussions within the Security Council. Um, today, you cannot have the creation of a peacekeeping operation without a very serious and, 
and and uh, and, and red thread, if you want, in the in the missions of uh, human rights, something that was you know you couldn't even mention the word human rights 15 to 20 years ago in the council, um, and uh, when you spoke to some of our force commanders until very recently, most of them couldn't even spell the words human rights. Um, that has changed, and it's changing very rapidly. It's quite interesting phenomenon, and historical terms are very rapid phenomenon. If you look at um, what is happening in the, in, the, in the Human Rights Council here in Geneva, the progress and the, the, the evolution of that body and what it's doing and the importance it's gaining is really quite, uh, quite interesting and quite something, um, in, certainly in historical terms. Um, we have, to put it in a, in a nutshell, if you want, we are, I think, uh, we have reached a much more sophisticated, sophisticated understanding of the complexities of the problems that the world is facing. With it comes a more sophisticated understanding, intellectual understanding, of what kinds of solutions are needed in order to really um, come to grips with these problems. What we haven't done, and which is one of the great struggles today, is to adapt our structures and our bureaucracies to actually implement those understandings. We mean, and I don't just speak about the UN, I speak about our member states, I speak about the international community as a whole, is still structured in a way that still responds very much to um, the way we saw the world 70 years ago. And the urgent need for us, and we'll come back to that in a second as well, is um, to figure out a way of, in, of translating that more sophisticated, more integrated understanding of what is at the root causes of problems and what is needed um, to solve them into tools that actually will do so, because today they don't. Um, so, we are, in, a, in a way, we are, beginning, we are coming around full circle um, uh, in our understanding to what was the original intention and understanding that was the basis for the creation of the Charter of the United Nations, a much more holistic, much more integrated um, uh, view of, uh, of what is needed to be done to have a peaceful world. I have a little bit of a problem personally with the kind of very rigid um, um, interpretations and classifications of the kinds of peace that you were mentioning. Uh, it makes uh, for interesting reading and maybe also it's an easier way to sort of clarify ideas and then move on. But in the real world, and certainly the way that uh, the UN has evolved over the past uh, uh, 70 years, it is a little bit of everything. And it's not even a little bit of everything in time, it's also a little bit of everything and different everythings, if you want, um, in, in the different situations that we find ourselves in. If there's one thing that we, we really have understood is that practically every security and peace problem is sui generis and there will be different elements that will that are the root causes and different elements that will need it to be uh, applied to the solutions in order to get there. Clearly there are um, common lessons to be drawn from many of them that can then be applied in the future. But even in that department we haven't been very good <coughs> and the ability of the UN system as a whole to learn from its uh, past lessons is, um, is limited to put it in a nice way. Um, I remember um, Oh, I, I very early on in my career, I was at a, as a lessons learned conference in Turin where they had invited the 11 police commissioners that had been serving until then in different peacekeeping operations. And within about five minutes of the start of the conference, they realized that they had all made the same mistake 11 times. Um, and that stuck with me, that lesson, because it's, um, it's, it's also very much part of what um, needs to change if you want, if we are going to craft a tool that is much more effective in, in getting to where we need to go. Okay, thank, thank you very much. Um, I sorry if you could perhaps follow up on that, uh, the, the last points that you made, and, and really think about the well, so-called real world, whatever that, um, that, that might be. Um, and if you could perhaps tell us a little bit, um, Davide uh, was quoting the original charter and you mentioned indeed that that was very much a charter that grew from the experiences of those who put down the pen and wrote it and agreed upon it and so on. So there's a mention of the two world wars and this was the very much a live experience for those involved in creating the United Nations um, at the closing stages of World War II. 
Now those closing stages are 70 years away um, from, from the present, so the world obviously has changed quite a bit. Uh, we hear a lot about um, the threats to peace, the, the nature of war has changed, um, the questions of international security have changed. We talk a lot about the fact that nation states rarely today, for example, go to war with other nation states, yet war still is a commonplace. Um, experience in many, many parts of the world. So in thinking in those terms, um, historians, we are very bad at predicting the future. We're very good at predicting the past. So we know, you know, we know something was inevitable after it happened. Uh, we can do that. And we have the luxury of doing so since nobody's really going to call us upon um, to, to we're you know, not going to lose our job if, uh, uh, if, if, if something goes wrong in the future. Um, the politicians in various countries think very much in the short term, particularly in democratic societies. Short-term thinking is the next election, basically. Or that's long-term thinking for a politician often. Uh, international institutions are over 70 years. Um, I don't think the UN is in any way ripe for retirement at 70. Um, so the retirement age certainly for the UN has been raised, um, as it is raised in many industrial, post-industrial societies. Um, but the challenges have changed, obviously. So what, from the perspective of high-level UN um, um, functionary, what seems to be in, in today's world of uh, whether we call it the globalized world or, or, or something else, the key challenges or the key uh, aspects that one should consider in trying to build structures that really fit today's world rather than the world of 1945, uh, which of course is when the, when the charter was written. Well, that's really is the central question today, isn't it? Um, well, first of all, let me just respond to one of the, react to one of the things. I think one of the problems in creating new structures is maybe that even UN officials don't lose their job if they get it wrong in the future, and um, we might be able to, we might want to re revisit that. But that's for another day. Um, I think that you know we created the UN and the international system that we have today on the on on the at the end of a of a world war that was devastating and where. There was a general understanding and, and, and agreement that we needed to put in place some structures, but also some rules of the game that, would, uh, that we could all agree to that would, would, would help us govern the planet in a way that, would not, that would, would not allow for this to happen again. And the, as you said, the world has changed absolutely incredibly since then. Um, the, 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 the very basic way in which we live and which we function has changed. And, um, uh, you know, the, the news um, uh, sort of drive us to think that the current problems, Syria, Central African Republic, Burundi today, um, Middle East for many decades now, um, that these are the, the sort of um, the, uh, the, 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 the main problems. But as far as I'm concerned, these are just symptoms of something um, much more, uh, much more, difficult and much more um, serious. Um, we are at a time now where we are facing um, uh, interlocking sort of existential problems, if you want. One is a trust deficit that is pretty pervasive at all levels of our, of our daily lives, whether it's at the international level, at the regional level, national level, or within societies. It's fueled by uh, many things, but it's fueled by uh, a, a very deep sense of injustice, uh, in many quarters, the fact that uh, inequity and equality is growing rather than diminishing, um, the, the, the distinct feeling that there is one justice for one group of us and another justice for others, um, that is reinforced by uh, technology, by the fact that we all now have access to information um, the instant it happens, and uh, we have access to medium means of communications that allows us to react to that news in a way that also um, creates a completely different set of um, expectations from the individual and abilities for the individual. Um, 
so we are uh, we we are in a we are in a in a very different um, uh, sort of framework in which um, uh, this is happening. For the past, I would say, ten years or so, this has is translating itself uh, increasingly in my mind to a sort of generalized free for all, a walking away of the rules from the rules, a walking away from international law, from the norms that we have set ourselves and we fought very hard for. Um, uh, over the past decades. Um, the understanding that we have amongst us, both within societies but also among societies, on how, uh, what are the basic rules that uh, we all should govern ourselves and our societies by. I think that is the overarching um, major threat to, um, to our way of life, if you want. And somehow we need to get it, we need to get it right. And the way to get it right, this comes, by the way, part of this mistrust is also, um, I think, um, governed and fueled by what we see as a, as a very fundamental change in the governance structures. Um, we are in a funny historical time, um, maybe something that you can write about in 10 years or so and get it right. Um, <laughs> But uh, I think that you know we are we are witnessing a time where the old structures, the old Westphalian structures, um, are fading away, um, um, but haven't quite done so. And new structures, where other partners are and other stakeholders are being brought in, not just in the conversations but also around the decision-making table, has not quite gelled. It's still very blurry. So we are sort of between two chairs. Um, vacuums have been created, and vacuums will always be filled, not necessarily always by the right um, people or the right actions. Uh, so it is, a, it is a difficult time, and it is a time where, um, um, where there's enormous amounts of uncertainty. We see it every day on, in our news, and we see uh, it uh, in many different kinds of manifestations. Um, but the fact is that um, everybody kind of does what Ever they think they want to do, um, the fact that um, um, the, the 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 arrest, if you want, that we saw some decades ago with the creation of R2P, um, and it, uh, where sovereignty was beginning to be put a little bit aside in a common understanding of what needed to be done to 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 govern us, is now um, back in uh, in the in the shadows and. Um, national sovereignty and the, the 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 assertion of that sovereignty is very very much uh, to the fore. Uh, the fact that you have um, armed and unarmed uh, groups, um, both um, politically motivated, religiously motivated, criminally motivated, may very often in a mix that is hard to understand, is creating new realities that we haven't really had to face before. That we need to be much more sophisticated at facing. Um, so I mentioned that governance uh, um, shift, if you want, because it's also where we need to look for some of the solutions that, uh, in order to, to counter that. Um, it's, we need to be much better at creating those partnerships um, that are needed. Um, if we um, rely just on our governments and our leaders, um, I forgot to mention the leadership deficit that we have that also fuels into uh, to this problem. I don't think we're going to make it. I think it's it's really important that civil society and its many different manifestations um, gets um, a, that we get our collective act together, if you want, in a way that uh, makes sense, that is structured, and that um, that brings back the legitimacy in the governance structures that we have, and allows people to uh, to trust that um, that their daily lives are going to be better if they um, leave it up to their leaders whoever they may be, whatever configuration we will come up with um, to, to have their, their best interest in mind. So there is some very fundamental differences. I think, as I said, started out by saying the values haven't changed. I think the implementation of those values has changed uh, tremendously. It has changed up and down, of, if you want, over the decades. But right now, I think we are in a situation where they have been put aside far too much. And we need to somehow figure out a way of bringing them back into the center of our, or of our uh, of our daily lives. If I may follow up with, uh, with what you've just said, uh, in a way, it might seem almost uh, as a provocation to say that uh, because of war and devastation, there was a catharsis that made the work of our and your forefathers easier in 1945. 
they could start from scratch in a way. Whereas for your generation of leaders, things are different because of the very peculiar way uh, the Soviet Union collapsed, because of the very peculiar way the unipolar uh, dominance of the United States in the 1990s ended. And so in a way, it's, it's a risky business for you to imagine these structures, these tools that you are referring to in your answer to the first question. And I, I, my question for you would be this, moving from this narrow understanding to a more sophisticated understanding and implementation of these rules entails risks. What are, I, I can clearly see the risks that we run if we stick with the old framework. What are the <coughs> risks of trying to implement these new structures? And what are the tools? You, you refer to partnerships, civil society, and bringing these, uh, these actors to the table. But what are the risks that we, and UN, and all of us run when trying these new policies? I think, frankly, you should turn the question around. What are the risks that we're going to run if we don't do it? Um, I think that um, um, it's quite clear that, uh, that we need to. Uh, we're not infallible. None of us are. We, I think we've proven that pretty emphatically over the years. Um, but I think that um, um, uh, there's no other way. I mean, there is... Uh, the, 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 well, let, me put, let me step back a bit and, uh, and remind you all of a couple of things. First of all, um, let's uh, not sort of descend completely into a negativity, but remind ourselves of as a, the fact that um, we've actually never had it so good. As a human race, we live longer, we live better, we're healthier, we're more educated, we're better connected. Uh, uh, we never in human history have we, um, and, and this is a product of precisely the system that we built uh, over the past 70 years um, to get us to where we are today. And so it's, it's not as if, uh, you know, what we've been doing until now has been a complete catastrophe, far from it. Um, that's the first thing, and it highlights what we stand to lose if we don't get the governance stuff right. Uh, but nevertheless, it's a very powerful fact um, that you know, less people die in wars, I mean, and I can go on, it's a very long list of, uh, of real extraordinary achievements that humankind has, uh, has arrived at um, today. The other thing is sort of more of a personal observation that uh, keeps me um, uh, being an optimist, which is that as a, as a human race, we are also very good. We have some extraordinarily strong survival instincts. Um, you know, when, you, when we have the knife at, the, at, at our throat, then somehow we figure it out. Part of the trick that we have to figure out now, um, because there are so many more of us on the planet, because the problems are so much more pervasive because of our mismanagement of the planet makes uh, the, the problems uh, really much more existentially dangerous, is how do we figure out a way of not always waiting till the moment that that knife is at our throat, but how do we figure out a way to be more preventive and to be more um, you know, prescient, um, as, as you were saying, uh, that we're not. Um, and I think we have the tools to do it. We certainly have the knowledge. We have an extraordinary amount of experience and expertise. We have the human capital, uh, not just in the UN system, uh, but, uh, but throughout the world. We have the funds. The money is there. That's not a problem. Um, we just somehow have to figure out how we remix those elements into something that's much more impactful than it has been until now. Um, so I think it's possible. Um, but I think there's a number of things that, uh, that need to happen. Since the political will to globally, and I'm generalizing now, but, but it, I, it's a pretty uh, sort of clear understanding. Since the political will to make the very needed structural changes in the international system are not present, um, and I come back to the leadership crisis that I mentioned before, then we have to find ways around the problem to get to where we need to do. It requires more energy, more waste of time, more waste of resources, but nevertheless, it's the only way around that I can think of because there is no other way. We can't just sit on our hands and say, um, you know, it's too difficult to do. It's not that difficult. It just needs a little bit more work. In order to get there, 
it's obviously um, uh, uh, it's an issue of, 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 of better collaborative approaches, much more integrated approaches. Let me just make a parenthesis here which, which highlights the importance of that. This year, member states are going to agree on a whole set of new policy frameworks uh, on the SDGs, on climate change, on financing for development. We've just come out of Japan on, on disaster risk mitigation on, and a whole series of other things that are happening. They are happening in parallel because, once again, we are working silos. And, but the reality of it is that once we get to these, if they actually do decide on them and they come up with something, however imperfect they are, the fact is that once we have to start implementing them on 1 January 2016, all of these are going to have to come together in a much more integrated way because you cannot talk about development without talking about climate. You cannot talk about the financing of development without talking about the other elements. You certainly can't talk about mitigating risk um, unless uh, you uh, talk about climate, you talk about development goals, etc. Now, in order to, uh, to integrate the, the work that needs to be done to have even a half a chance at actually having an impact and helping member states to get to those goals, we as a system have to come up with ways of working better together that we've never seen before. Now, at the leadership level, uh, I think that understanding has seeped in. My colleagues who are heads of agencies here, and by the way, most of the agencies who have the mandate and the wherewithal to actually do that are all here in this town, um, or most of them are. The fact is that the, the leadership understands it. The problem is that the bureaucracy down the silos, that takes a little longer or a lot longer for it to sink in. Um, but that is also happening. The problem is it's not happening fast enough, so we have to figure out ways of doing that and, and provoking a rethinking really fast. I mean, we're talking uh, now. Um, the way to do that is not just to create the partnerships, but you have to, to give those partnerships tools. Um, there are two areas that we need to look at, and this is also much more long-term. One is to um, encourage our friends in the media to um, regain their sense of responsibility to educate and regain their sense of responsibility to be counterweights to power both of which they by and large have lost in their seek for uh, in their so in their search for for profit and for um, you know the sort of infotainment um, grooves we have gotten ourselves into certainly in the west um, and hand in hand with that uh, need we need to look at uh, how we revitalize our educational systems um, you have 7 billion cell phones on this planet today that's almost a cell phone per person, which means that everybody has a voice. Most of these voices are pretty uneducated and speak from a very narrow local perspective, which is legitimate. But if we are going to need, if we're going to get to where we need to get, needs to be better informed and placed in a context that is a little broader than just what happens immediately in, in, in our individuals uh, and neighborhoods. So the two aspects and the two responsibilities of press and education systems becomes even more crucial today um, than, than what we have. You mentioned um, the short-termism of our current um, electoral system, which is a major problem. Most of the problems we're facing today are long-term problems. You're not going to sell, solve, you know, the, the SDGs are, uh, are set for 15 years. Uh, climate change stuff is not going to happen in five minutes, certainly not in three years. So somehow we have to uh, have a collective understanding and figure out how we change that dynamic, that very negative dynamic, which does not allow our politicians and therefore our resource allocators to plan you know, at, a long, at a longer uh, vision uh, than we do today, which is three years, in the best of circumstances, five years, which is totally inadequate uh, and which is, doesn't allow for a long-term vision or for systems to be put in place that understand that there will be failures, that, you know, so uh, we mentioned about failing and getting fired. No, you, you know, development uh, of a country and help bring a failed state back on, into, a, into a healthy state is going to be trial and error, and it's going to take a minimum of 30 years, if not more. And in order to do that, you need to have some very clear visions and policies that um, and integrated policies um, that that help that state. I um, I served in Haiti uh, many years ago and uh, helped put up one of our first missions there, 
And one of the major problems we had, it was, you know, Haiti is a small place. Uh, it's pretty obvious what needs to be done, at least at the surface. Um, it was a, a collapsed state already back in the 80s. And it's even more collapsed now with the, the, the series of, uh, of uh, natural catastrophes that have fallen on it. But uh, so, you know, we tried hard to get the World Bank, UNP, UNICEF, uh, WHO, everybody else who was there, to work and sing from the same song sheet. And everybody paid lip service for it. And then, you know, as soon as you turned your back, they all did and went off and did the same thing. We had the same, uh, and to give you another example, back in, in the 80s when we, um, we, we clinched uh, or dis negotiated the peace in El Salvador, my colleague, uh, Alvaro de Soto, who was running those negotiations, was totally frustrated because at the same time as he was signing an agreement um, that everybody signed on to for the peace, the World Bank was imposing stuff that was in complete contradiction to what the peace treaty has just, what that just been signed was doing. So uh, these kinds of things uh, can no longer be entertained and simply can't. Uh, so we have to figure out how the structures, uh, um, how we can affect the change both at the practical level but also at the political level. And there I come back to the partnership. Um, this is only going to happen if we fire up civil society in a, in a concerted way to actually push our politicians to do stuff. Let me give you just one example that, or two examples that shows how that, that it's possible and it has been done in the past. There's an example that keeps being repeated, but for good reason, and that is the Ottawa Treaty which banned, which banned line mines. Member states and governments were, there was no way in hell they were going to sit down and negotiate the, uh, the, um, the, um, the, 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 the business of not using um, um, mines anymore. Um, it took one woman, Jody Williams, <coughs> to really fire up civil society to um, impose the will of the people on their governments. And today we, we have saved, I don't know how many hundreds of thousands of lives uh, and have pushed development in a number of countries because it's become mind free, um, simply because civil society said enough was enough. Um, I guarantee you that uh, what I mentioned before, the shortness of time in historical terms of the evolution of human rights um, in the way that we do business, it would never have happened without civil society and without the push that we, uh, they, they, they pushed. So if it had left it up to governments, we would still be in human rights stone age. Thank you, Thank you. yeah. That, um, share a lot of the uh, points that you, you just made, um, particularly the last one, um, but I think you also opened uh, opened for uh, the possibility for, for me to ask the next question, which uh, you cannot have a discussion about the United Nations without mentioning the word reform, right? Uh, reform is what is always needed, always has been, always will be. Um, and but I want to approach this in a slightly different sort of historian's way. Um, the UN is. As you have pointed out already, it's a very, very different uh, UN today than it was 70 years ago. 70 years ago, we had 51 member states. Today, we have 193. So we almost quadrupled the number of member states. 70 years ago, there were 41 NGOs that had so-called consultative status uh, with, for, with, the, with the UN. Today, we have 3,900. Um, that have that um, consultative status. Um, there are, of course, things that haven't changed. The Security Council is the way it is. There is the P5, um, and, and so on and so forth. But given this proliferation, which I think reflects a number of historical developments, decolonization, of course, uh, a key one among them, explaining the explosion in the number of member states that belong to the UN, the rise of civil society in a way that you you already um, touched upon. But to me, it seems that this sort of explosion, this complexity, that the expansion in member states, in consultative organizations, uh, in UN agencies themselves, um, leads to, can lead to inertia, competition among the agencies, among the NGOs, among the nation states that, uh, that are part of it. Um, and then, 
when we hear, as we have heard in the 21st century, the, the goal being delivering as one uh, is, is one of those catchphrases from the, the um, from Kofi Annan, in, in effect. Um, that goal seems to me is getting further and further away um, from where we can, where the United Nations can get to, simply because there isn't the UN anymore. Um, the UN is a number of different things, a number of isolated institutions, agencies, organizations, with competing, sometimes competing or at least overlapping interests. So I'm wondering, is the UN, as it is structured today, number is it is it the, the right organization to tackle those many problems you you have identified um, is it is it really ready to deliver um, on that vision of peace which of course is um, is in some ways a utopian vision a perpetual peace as, as David pointed out uh, earlier on but is the UN is the, or is there something that should be done in terms of the very structure of the United Nations that would help us to get to that goal, to deliver as one, or, or at least to deliver as on the key points that, that you have identified as the key challenges today for the United Nations? Mm. Well, I'll give you a diplomat's answer, which is yes and no. <laughs> <laughs> we can talk after. Uh, yeah, but it's a... Uh, yeah. Look, I mean, on the surface of it, the answer is obviously no. The structure is antiquated, it's creaking. Um, it was created 70 years ago, the world has moved on and the system hasn't. Um, but that's just, uh, that's a too easy an answer. Um, because the, it has the bones, if you want, um, and the content of the system is incredibly rich and incredibly experienced and has quite a lot to offer. It's its application, it's the, the application it's allowed to do also politically from our masters. It's the investment that it gets or doesn't get and we can talk about very recent examples on, um, on the link between the support from, by member states or the lack of same and the ability of an organization to, uh, to deliver. WHO is one example in the Ebola system. I think that I disagree with you, um, particularly up to a point. When you and, and it's part of my answer. When you talk about um, the concept of uh, the UN as one or delivering as one, um, and your interpretation of that, or your view, or your perception of that, it speaks to a fundamental. It speaks to a fundamental problem um, that needs to be redressed, and which is very much something I'm trying to do these days which is that when we speak about the UN and when we, um, we think about it, most of us, um, our perception is fueled by a very small percentage of what the system is doing. It's the Security Council that you mentioned. It's the fact that we're not able to really come to grips with some of the wars that are going on right now. It's because we were a little late in, uh, or very late in, uh, in responding to the Ebola epidemic. And when I say we, it's all of us. It's not just WHO, it's the whole system and the member states as well. But the fact is that what, we, what the system does for every single person on this planet on a daily basis is a hell of a lot more than that. It's at least, you know, it's the iceberg thing. 10% is what you see, 90% is of the stuff, the, the operational stuff that really happens. I, I mean, I, many of you will have heard me say this, um, but I, it bears repeating. There isn't a single person on this planet that isn't touched every day by something the system does. Every single day and several times a day for most of us. Every single one of you, when you wake up in the morning, you don't even realize that a lot of the stuff that, uh, that you do, from the moment you brush your teeth till you go out in the streets, um, there are things happening in your surroundings that were all done or set um, uh, or implemented by one UN organization or the other. The cell phones you have in your pocket, there's at least five organizations in Geneva without which you wouldn't be able to use your phones. So uh, there are millions of, of these examples. But the fact is that the operational aspect of it and this comes back to our perception of what it takes to make peace, and I'll come to that in a second, um, is, is, uh, is, is the real meat of what we do, and, um, and is, not, is absent from most people's minds, including our politicians, by the way. Um, we have in this town an absolutely extraordinary ecosystem that has built up, been built up in the past 150 years, and the investment in that is, is based on very 
narrow financial understandings by most people who sit in finance ministries around the world. And that needs to expand. They need to understand what is at stake much better than they do now because we're going to lose a lot of it and to everybody's detriment. But the fact is that when you look at, at that and then you link it to the issue of peace and security, and when we, if we really buy in and, and fundamentally understand the link between peace and security and development and the overarching link of human rights, any of those three on the three-legged stool, if it isn't present, you're not going to get the other two. That is a really fundamental understanding that has to uh, in, 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 uh, that has to inform the way that we structure our system, that we do our business, and most of us do. When you go to the field, when you go to, I'll give you an example. I was last year uh, sent to Tunisia to help them celebrate the um, the new constitution, which by any measure is one of the best constitutions around, including most Western states. It's a really forward-looking, very sophisticated uh, constitution that they've made. When I got there, I sat down with the country team, the UN country team, and I realized that they collectively had been one of the main advisors to the government in how to get to that constitution. Because they worked as one, and because they were able to really um, uh, bring to bear the collective experience and lessons learned and best practices from around the world to that country to help them get to that. I'm not saying that there weren't others helping them, there were of course, but it was a very clear example of where delivering as one helped. Now, we have a system where for that to happen at its optimum is entirely dependent on individuals, it will, and which is, it will always be. You know, um, uh, the, the role of the right individual at the right place is practically immeasurable. Um, just look at the new pope we have. Um, he's rather a good example of uh, what one individual can do to change perceptions and to change reality in a very short period of time. Um, so the, the, the delivering as one actually works where we have the right person in charge. Uh, it doesn't work in many other contexts. And it certainly lo doesn't look like it's working when you look at it from a headquarters perspective uh, where you have the headquarters of the different organizations with their different uh, governance structures, where there are different financing structures, uh, where everybody has their little flag and, uh, and the pride of place uh, for their role, and where we, as you mentioned, indeed compete um, for a shrinking pot of money. Um, so in, you know, that's a reality today, but it's a reality that has to change. And it has to change structurally as well. There is absolutely no reason why we have three or four or five different humanitarian organizations all working basically and the same goal but in parallel and competing for money. Um, there is a, we created a, a, a coordinating machinery uh, many years ago precisely because of that problem. Now that coordinating machinery has become an agency in its own right, um, which is a you know, typical bureaucratic thing to happen. Uh, so what we haven't done over the years, which needs to happen very regularly in bureaucratic settings is that the pruning that, uh, need, that is necessary, just like with trees in order to make sure that they stay healthy, hasn't happened often enough and, and, and radically enough. Um, the same with development aid. We have the World Bank, we have UNDP, we have a, a number of other agencies that are um, competing for pride of, pl of first place on who is the, 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 the lead development agency. It makes absolutely no sense, particularly if we, re if we, we, go, we go back to that understanding of the, of the three-legged stool then we need to find structures that are much more integrated and are much more working in a matrix uh, format. Um, one of the things that I pushed uh, always, for example, very hard was in today's world it made no sense to me and still doesn't make any sense to me that we have a peacekeeping operations department and a, peace, and a, and a political department. You cannot make peace without having uh, a completely um, seamless relationship between those who sit and analyze the problem and those who are going to implement the solutions to addressing them. And yet we have two departments um, that spend a considerable amount of their time fighting each other um, and, um, and it makes no sense whatsoever. Anyway, so again, this comes back to the kind of political support uh, uh, that we get, the, the political uh, jockeying um, and all of that uh, eventually, you know, reality has a way of imposing itself sooner rather than later on everybody and it is, it is very much clearly imposing itself on our system right now. Um, it's going to be painful for, for some people, um, it's going to be painful for some countries, 
But unless we do it, um, uh, we are not going to be able to solve the problems that we have ahead of us. We have the wherewithal, we have the knowledge, we have the money. Um, what we need is a will. Before opening the floor for questions from the public, I would like to ask you a more personal question. I will read an excerpt from um, Emily Dickinson's poem entitled, I many times thought peace had come. She says, I many times thought peace had come when peace was far away, as red men deemed the, the sea land at the center of the sea. How can a UNDG like yourself keep his vision of peace alive when peace is so far away and when the red man's metaphors seem to be so real? Well, first of all, I'm an optimist. Um, I was born that way, thank God, because otherwise I wouldn't be in this business. But having, <laughs> having said that, um, I, you know, peace is not that far away in many cases. In some cases, particularly those you read about on the front pages, it seems that way. But um, we have made peace in massive amounts of places, most of which you never heard of, mainly because peace making is a discrete activity. So on the on the and, and even today, particularly now in Geneva, actually uh, more and more we are getting uh, we are we are seeing uh, the resurgence of Geneva as a, as a platform for multilateral diplomacy. As we speak, um, there's talks going on on Syria, on Georgia. We're about to have talks. Uh, that's a scoop, by the way, but because it's not public yet. But we're going to have talks on Yemen. Um, there is a number of things on the on the uh, Great Lakes on Burundi, uh, and this is not just the UN, these are our partners that are beavering away at, uh, at mediation and, and peacemaking. Um, so it's happening, we're doing it. Um, in some cases we're doing it rather well. Um, cross your fingers, all of you, for Cyprus to be solved. It's only been 50 years, um, so, but it's, a, it's, it's time. It's actually one of these uh, I was, I was in Cyprus as uh, SRHD for a while and, and negotiator. And it's one of these bizarre problems, I called it a luxury problem, that was, should have been solved a long time ago. But where the geopolitical juxtapositions weren't right, they are now. And um, hopefully we will see some movement as uh, there is uh, some, um, there's some good chances that we might see it. And I hope that uh, a cliche that I use about Cyprus, which was also used very often in the Middle East and still is, that these people never miss an opportunity to miss an opportunity, is not going to be proven true this time. But I just, I, I'm saying this because I, I, one shouldn't lose sight of what is happening and what is, what is going on and how the, the combined experience of the system is being brought to bear in a whole series of situations. Um, and it just reminds me to tell you that try again to turn the question around and think about where we would be today if the UN didn't exist or if all of these other partners that we have weren't active and didn't exist. I guarantee you we would be in a very, very w much worse place than we are today. Um, and, and it doesn't mean that we shouldn't uh, continue trying to improve on it very much so because I think that, um, as I said earlier, um, we have uh, we have mismanaged our planet and we need to um, up our game considerably in order to arrest the results of that mismanagement um, and, and, and um, preserve and protect w the, the very real achievements that we have uh, arrived at. Thank you. Um, I think it's time now to turn the floor over for some, some questions. Um, so please. and. When, uh, when you ask a question, can you, number one, identify yourself, number two, ask a question. Do not give a statement or a speech. Um, we can have those afterwards, um, but please uh, just try to be brief and, and to the point. Do you want to call out people? Okay. Hi, uh, thanks for putting on this event. I'm Kofi Debra, and I'm developing creative industries in, in Ghana. So I, I want to ask, what role or how can the arts and arts artists play um, in helping to shape more holistic visions uh, of peace into the collective conscious of we the people? Okay, 
Uh, maybe, shall we take a couple of questions and then, so there's one in the back there. Hello, my name is Mandy Turner. Sorry, I've got a terrible cold. <clears throat> uh, and I'm based in Jerusalem. So you could probably anticipate what my question is going to be. Um, one of the big failures has been um, Israel-Palestine. And I just wondered if you might reflect on what the future lies there, because all I see is very gloomy at the moment. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, is there another easy question? Uh, <laughs> perhaps we'll take one, one over here and then... Uh... Thank you. I'm, uh, I'm a student in Lausanne University and advisor specializing in MENA region. Uh, we talk too much about peace, and especially in MENA region. Uh, first of all, I, I wonder, we speak too much about peace and how uh, United Nations accept criminals as a representative of people in, in Geneva here. For me, uh, I, uh, Egypt, Algeria, Morocco, Tunisia, all the governors are criminals. They kill people every day. Why you accept them here? Thanks. Okay, so only a couple of easy questions, perhaps. Three easy questions. <laughs> All good questions. Um, I like the first one best. <laughs> and because it's a really good one. The others are good one too, but they're a little bit more hard. But the role of art in, uh, in making peace, I think, is crucial. Not just in making peace, but in making our world a better place to live in. Um, I was reminded of it just before, before coming here. Uh, the um, the pavilion at the um, Venice Biennale that got the Golden Lion for best pavilion was the Armenian pavilion, um, which obviously is probably placed in a context of the 100th anniversary of the genocide, or the G word as some people call it, uh, because we're not supposed to be talking about it. Um, but um, I think that it's a an element, a cul the cultural element in our search for better societies and, and in a search for peace is always hovering there and of course artists have always been at the forefront of social change of, um, of, of, and of, of, of thinking of how we can, we can affect that change. I personally think that uh, we can do more and I'm trying very much to do. I'll give you an example that uh, comes from my daily life. We have at the Palais des Nations at least uh, over a hundred cultural events every year, what we call cultural diplomacy, where member states showcase their, um, um, their, um, the, their culture, whether it's um, literature, it's music, it's art. The two ladies that sit right behind you are responsible for making sure that that happens. Um, so it's very much part of our daily lives and, um, and it should be, as far as I'm concerned, also from an aesthetic point of view, much more part of our daily lives. Um, but it's important. If you walk the corridors of the Palais, you will see art pieces of varying degrees of excellence. Uh, nevertheless, they are uh, there because member states feel that it's important that their cultural heritage is part of the visual environment in which peace is made. And I think it's very important. Now, Palestine and the Middle East. Uh, you remind me of a very venerable Norwegian diplomat that I met when I was uh, fairly young in my, um, in my career. I had just been sent to Tehran during the war and he was practically the first one I met. It was New Year's Eve. Um, and we were talking about the Middle East and he told me two things that stuck with me that you may have heard before. The first one was that the um, Middle East problem um, it was and is a family feud that we had allowed to go international at our at uh, which was a major mistake. We should have allowed it to stay um, uh, in 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 a sort of regional context or a national context. And the second thing was he, he told me that <clears throat> if you think that you understand what's going on there, all it means is that you're misinformed, um, and um, it's probably true. I don't have a crystal ball about what's going on there. I do have hopes though. For example, I'm very hopeful, 
maybe I'm too hopeful, but I'm hopeful that if we get a um, deal on the Iranian nuclear issue, that that will be a game changer that will have a spillover effect, both maybe negative, but certainly also positive. I think that the pressures from what's happening in the wider region, both in Syria and the spillover of that, is beginning to change some of the, the dynamics in the border region um, and is pushing um, some of the more recalcitrant of these countries to think in slightly different ways about how um, they're going to interact with their neighbors. Um, I think that um, it is a problem that has been allowed to fester for far too long and also being used by some of the regional players, small and big, um, as a fig leaf for their own inadequacies and their own failed policies, um, at least vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the world. Um, the, 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 the role of the UN there is, uh, is not a particularly glorious one. UN in the sense, if you want, certainly of the Security Council. I don't think there's a region that has had more um, unimplemented uh, resolutions than the Israeli-Palestinian problem. Um, that uh, speaks to the power politics of the last several decades. I think there's a shift there as well. It's been very interesting to watch the Obama administration change its tune of how it's going to, how it is shifting its uh, relationship, um, not only with Israel, but also with, uh, with uh, Saudi Arabia. Um, because of other, other reasons, because of oil policy reasons. But so I, there is, there is kind of some tectonic changes that are happening, the, re, the reactions of which, um, you know, I'm like the historians, I'm very careful about predicting the future. Um, but I certainly do think that there will be changes that, well, that, that we will see. Um, whether they are good or not remains to be seen, but we all need to continue trying. Um, I think that um, the fact that the UN for the past few years has been sidelined um, by, all, by all, you know, measurements um, is not a good thing, but again, it's a reflection of the current uh, problems and the current uh, power relations or lack of same that we're seeing, a fractured region, um, superpowers that are in confrontation with each other and have a hard time getting together even on an issue like that. And um, the, the, uh, uh, and the, the, these fractions and these confrontations have overridden, if you want, the normal role of the UN, which in many of these places is, uh, is a glorified fig leaf for, for their inaction. Um, so hopefully we'll get back. Uh, to 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 having a much more uh, effective and, and active involvement. Having said that, you have to remember that we never left. Um, I have many colleagues who work um, on the ground um, in the Middle East and who I also very much think um, would, if they weren't there, the situation would be even worse than it is today. Uh, the 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 bridge between the Palestinians and Hamas and others um, that we provide, um, in both in terms of an ongoing conversations, but also on very specific issues that tr crop up, um, has been um, has been very instrumental in keeping the lid to some extent on some of the the worst um, uh, the worst uh, violence. Now, on the other questions and how we can um, allow what you consider to be criminals. It's one of these questions that sometimes um, I don't quite understand, frankly. Because if you are in the, pre in the business of trying to make peace, um, if you don't speak to the person, who, uh, to your enemy, or to those who are considered to be at the root of, uh, of the, the crisis or the war or the, uh, in the first place, then how are you going to make that peace? Um, I, I have been in situations like that um, when I, I told you I was in Haiti where um, I arrived at a time when the, the democratically elected president had been kicked out by the country and there was a mili military junta in place with a police chief that um, had blood up to his neck and had killed personally, I don't know how many, hundreds of people. Um, a very unsavory character. but we were sent there to, 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 to make peace and to create a situation uh, that would allow for the return of the, the, elected, uh, the elected president. So uh, the, the stigmatizing of actors 
obviously needs to be going on and the conversation that happens between actors that are not um, playing, uh, even less playing by the rules than others, obviously has to happen in a framework of, of criticism, but you have to continue talking to them. We have the talks on Syria right now. Most of these people in a court of law would be thrown into prison uh, on the spot if we really applied the rule of law to them on both sides. Um, certainly Syria is one of these situations where there is absolutely no um, and no one who can claim to be righteous or have been done, uh, have been behaved in the right way according to international law. But frankly, that's what the UN is about. This is, we were created not only to provide um, a table around which everybody who disagrees can sit down and discuss rather than fight, but we were also created um, to not to fight war, but to prevent war uh, and to try and uh, heal the consequences of it. So um, I think personally that we are bound to speak to everybody. Um, in the full knowledge of who they are and how they behave and the f and not forgetting that at some day there will be re reckoning and being quite clear about it. I can talk to, um, to whoever I think is a criminal and who has very obviously uh, needs to be brought uh, to justice for his action, but until we can get to that point and I need to speak to that person in order to stop the worst uh, exactions that are going on. Okay, I think, thank you. I think we have time for maybe another quick round of questions and then we shall close. We have uh, one right here and the second one. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Hello and thank you. I appreciate your statements very, very much. They're very encouraging. I'm a UN brat. My dad was at the UN in 49 and he worked all his life in the UN. I then worked in the UN. It makes me very emotional because it's not the place that I knew. When I, when I was there as a kid, everybody hoped the UN was going to make the world better. It was a place that was open and the people who worked in it were extremely gifted, talented people who really wanted to work because they believed in the UN. Today in the UN, I find it's a bureaucracy. It's stuck. People stab each other in the back. It breaks my heart. When I was in the UN, it was open. When I came back to Geneva and I saw the barriers, it's something that I cannot stand. I'm, and I'm I think the UN has question? to give, the question is, the UN has to change. The UN has to create a think tank where new ways are, are started. So the artists have great ideas, use them. Do something different. Democracy is not working anymore. Systems have to change. And the UN is a place where you can do it. What do you suggest? Okay, thank you. And then we have another question here. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Christophe Barbe. She almost voiced my question, though differently. Talk, talk to us about democracy in the digital age. You talk a lot about individuals, we the people, but I think it's a key issue for the future together on the planet. Thank you. Okay, thank you, and I think we can take... Uh, no, we don't do follow-ups today. <laughs> um, we can have another... Uh, back there, okay. perhaps? Sorry. Oh, here, yeah. This. I'll just come up. Thank you. Um, my name is Erika Santas. I'm an international relations student from Hungary. Uh, my question is more about human rights. I'm wondering what are the actual tools of the UN or the international community to enforce governments to respect human rights in order to prevent further regulations, further, uh, further um, massive human rights violations? Okay. Thank you. So. Okay. Um. Madam, I am 100% in agreement with you, and we're doing something about it. First of all, uh, both uh, intellectually but also physically, I agree with you that in a city like Geneva, um, having a UN that looks like Fort Knox doesn't make any, doesn't make any sense, and we're trying to open it up. Um, I am in a constant fight with um, my own security services, who uh, obviously 
um, like every security services on the planet, uh, spends most of its time justifying its own existence by piling it on. Um, but we're in a city where the police office, the police um, uh, station closes, uh, is open an hour a day and the Air Force goes home for lunch and, you know, it uh, <laughs> it's, doesn't make any sense. So um, we, are, we have opened up the, um, the Palais. Um, I don't know if you were here when we did that a few months ago when um, we had, back in the winter, we had uh, about 3,000 runners go through the park. Most of them had never set foot there before. Uh, we're doing open days. We are bringing in kids. We are doing a number of things. We are, I'm in the process of reevaluating the whole um, security perimeter to see if we can open up the park to the public, um, etc. these kinds of things. But this, this is just a physical aspect, and clearly um, my objective to integrate um, the international Geneva part of Geneva into the local and having much greater interaction between the two um, is, is very much part of my daily work. I, it's the fourth time I live in Geneva, and I was always puzzled by the fact that in a city of less than 400,000 people, we lived on two different planets that kind of circled each other and rarely touched each other. That doesn't make any sense, particularly in a world that is much more integrated. Um, interestingly enough, when you tell that to the local Geneva, they agree, but somebody had to, you know, do the pushing. So that's what we're doing now, and uh, the conversations that have started uh, between the two sides are getting richer and richer and more and more integrated. This also is translating itself into something you mentioned, which is uh, the creation of... Um, of um, um, not just a think tank about what we're going, to, how we're going to change the UN, uh, but uh, think tanks on substance. Um, we very much work with this institution here. We work with the Geneva University. We recently had the first uh, summit of think tanks worldwide. We had about 80, I think, of them here from all over the world. Yesterday evening, I was with 27 rectors of uh, uni universities from Europe that uh, collectively signed a request to become part of. Uh, both the, um, the ECOSOC, but also part of something called the UN Academic Impact, which is a network of universities that, that do precisely that. So we're working on it. It's, uh, it's not something that happens in one day, but the, the, uh, the, the, the desire and the impetus is there. Um, now, as to your description of, um, of a bureaucracy, I, I agree, it is a bureaucracy, but uh, I also have found in the year and a half that I'm here, that it's a bureaucracy where the individual members of it are quite ready to break out of it if they're given half a chance. And um, if you, um, you change a little bit the management and you open up uh, both in terms of listening but also talking and having, um, allowing people a much greater um, possibility for, uh, for I innovation and for taking risks and for, then you find very quickly that um, they're satisfaction level with their own job shoots up um, the, uh, the, the effectiveness of their individual um, uh, uh, work is, uh, goes up as well and everybody is, uh, is happier. It's also not something that changes from one day to the other um, but uh, it's, it's a little human and social engineering that is entirely possible and that we're all working on right now. So hopefully when you come back and visit us in a couple of months, you will find a happier place um, and one that you recognize from the past. Well, okay, <laughs> you know, then if you come often, then you'll be able to see the change over a period of time. Um, digital age, uh, I mean, obviously, obvious. One of the things that keeps, that, that I'm, I'm still puzzled about, there are two major issues um, that are going to be determining and are determining already um, in how the planet is going to move forward uh, that we're not really uh, engaged in to the extent that I thought we ought to be and I still think we ought to be. One of them is the digital issue, internet governance, cybersecurity, all of that stuff. And the other thing is migration, uh, both of which are defining issues uh, for how things are going to move forward. Uh, all you have to do is open the paper today on the migration issue. Um, but where, uh, just to deal with that very quickly, where there isn't a center, there isn't a, 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 a center of excellence, if you want, or, a, or an agency or somebody who actually sits and, and, uh, and thinks through the, 
the intellectual aspects of this. We have the IOM, which is doing a great job on the operational aspect of migration, and which is not part of the UN, although we work very closely together. But And we have a special representative of the SG, um, um, Peter Sutherland, who has been tasked to, to do some of the, uh, the collective thinking on the issue, but who is completely unsupported. He's paying his own travel tickets. He doesn't have any assistance, and he's kind of doing this on a pro bono basis, basically, which to me makes no sense whatsoever. But anyway, be that what is may, we are going to get there. On the digital age, it's a little bit more difficult. Um, I think, interestingly enough, Geneva is uh, is is becoming more and more the platform for um, uh, attempts that comes from all different kinds of sides <coughs> to come to grips with how we are going to craft something that looks like um, uh, a governance model that makes sense. Um, it's it's a very complex one and it's a very interesting one. Um, I, I am one of those who think that it probably shouldn't be in the UN because, at least not in the UN that we know today, which is a, an organization made for states and by states, because the whole idea and the whole um, interest, I think, for all of us is to make sure that internet governance remains as open and as democratic and as uh, user-friendly and people-friendly as possible. So you have to come up with governance structures that are what I was referring to earlier, these kind of multi-stakeholder uh, arrangements where you have um, both governments but also certainly business but also um, other actors in civil society, academia and others, uh, in some sort of uh, matrix structure that will allow us to do this governance in a way that uh, makes sense. It's complex because um, if you do that, and particularly in this world that is in neither one or the other, um, the questions of how you, uh, you uphold the law, how you uh, sanction people who don't play by the rules that we set, uh, is going to be difficult. Um, uh, but I mean, that doesn't mean that we shouldn't try. And it's happening, it's in a fragmented, but I, from what I see here, um, over the past year that I've been here, a year and a half, I see a kind of a, of a slow getting together and gelling of these different conversations. But we haven't quite gotten there yet. Question. What was your question? Democracy. 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 Well, this is what I'm touching on, I'm telling you. That's what I'm saying. Okay, <laughs> well, I mean, and I'm telling you that I may not be telling it in a way that you can understand, but let me try again. I'm. Yes, but this is what I'm telling you is that this is not a role just for the UN, okay. precisely because the UN is at a place that is governed by governments. And if it's up to governments, you're going to get a very different kind of internet and digital age than the one we really want. So we need to figure out, we, that's the point I'm trying to make. We need, and, and this is, but this is, well, you can't get more democratic than that, other than what I'm telling you. <laughs> 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 well, we all have to do it, that's the answer. Yeah, and, that, and, and, and it's not just the West, you know, you have to, uh, it's, it's something that, it's one of these issues where we have to make sure that everybody's involved in the, in the conversation. And this is why I'm saying it's a very interesting what's going on here, because this is particularly in the sort of very fragment, increasingly fragmented world that we are in. Geneva has this brand of a place where you can do that without having everybody's agenda cut across and trying interfering with what you're doing. It is a neutral place and it is the ideal place to try and figure out how we're going to do that in the, in the most quiet or peaceful or democratic way uh, possible. So, you know, do your part. Um, on the human rights, um, I think actually, you, uh, the, you know, eight years ago, I think, what, eight or ten years ago, whenever it was, when, we, when the, the, the um, the Human Rights uh, Commission was changed into the Council. And um, our colleagues and some of our member states invented the Universal Periodic Review Mechanism. I don't think that m many of them realized how extraordinarily useful it would evolve. Um, and that is the mechanism that we have now that holds every single country to account. And strangely enough, particularly in this, uh, in this world that we're in now, Every single country submits itself to, uh, to, to, to review. There is not a country that doesn't go there. There may be, but even North Korea uh, gets it, whether they like it or not. I had um, an interesting uh, experience last year, that kind of a sort of a mini epiphany. I was sitting at the airport 
waiting for a plane and the the, uh, the ambassador of a small African country came in and we were sitting having a coffee and he was explaining to me that the day before his country had presented its, um, its uh, UPR and they had made a video link between the room 20 in which this happens and the UNDP offices in his capital where the whole government was sitting plus everybody that was anybody in governance, all the heads of in, in civil society organizations all the heads of academic institutions, and uh, they sat and listened for a whole day to the debate. And then after that, this sparked a national debate on where the country was in terms of human rights. Now, this is a country that uh, today is in deep trouble and already at that time was having some very severe uh, political um, infighting. But nevertheless, it was a, a very clearly defined moment for them and showed to me to what extent these uh, UPRs are becoming a tool in, um, in bringing about, I, I, I usually say that, you know, we try, we always talk about mainstreaming um, certain issues into the way we work. As far as I'm concerned, human rights has now gone into our bloodstream. It's really quite extraordinary to see how it is a basic element in practically everything that we do. Um, so I think, you know, we've gotten a lot further than we were a very few years ago. And um, it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's also a work in progress and we'll get there. But it's very interesting what's happening in the council, not least because um, you know the, the sort of political dynamics have changed after all P5 members are members of it since last year. And uh, it's very clear that also because the Security Council isn't working as it should, that a number of issues that they can't get to grips with there are being brought here, which makes it both more dangerous in a way, but also certainly more interesting and more lively. Uh, so the system in, on that aspect is is working, in my mind, a lot faster and a lot better than I would have imagined. doesn't mean it's perfect, but nothing is perfect. Okay, thank you very much. I think it's my um, displeasure, actually, to, to close the event. Uh, it's been... It's been a great discussion, wide-ranging, it's touched upon, in fact, on a lot of the issues that the uh, Graduate Institute, of course, is engaged with uh, on, a, on a daily basis, from human rights to migration and um, security, obviously. So I just wanted to thank Mr. Muller for, for his time, for coming to, um, to the Graduate Institute to participate in this event, my colleague Davide Rodonio, uh, for... Uh, for for being here, and most of all, thanks to all of you who, you know, came on a sunny um, Saturday afternoon um, to the Graduate Institute to participate in this in this ongoing discussion about the visions uh, of peace and, and visions for the future of the United Nations. Thank you very much.